So let's talk about Beanie Babies, because in this video, we're going to talk about mass-produced scarcity, how it relates to modern era collectibles, and what's happening in these markets as to why when a mass-produced modern era collectible becomes popular, it is almost always a bad investment to attempt to invest in over the long term. I'm going to prove it to you in this video. Today, we're going to be talking about Beanie Babies. We're going to talk about Lego. We're going to talk about Funko Pops. And we're going to talk about limited run games just to prove this point so I can show you how manufacturers take advantage of these market crazes at your expense. And if you're attempting to speculate, invest in this stuff over the short term, over the long term, as these companies continue to release more and more product into the market, it becomes that much harder to decipher which of these products are going to be valuable, not only in the short term, but if you're a Timmy Kimmy or Poindexter holding this stuff for the long term, you really have to understand these market dynamics if you want to make a profit. This is why I've said this once, I'll say it again. Most people that speculate on collectibles do not make as much money as somebody who goes out and just buys a simple S&P 500 index fund and holds it for the long term through thick and thin. If you really want to make money, that's really what you should be doing. Just work a second job if you need to, put all that money in the S&P 500 index fund, let it ride, and you'll be set. Instead, a lot of you guys are trying to come into the collectible space because you love Pokemon and you think you're going to make your fortune in Pokemon cards. So this is a cautionary tale for you guys because all these manufacturers use the concept of mass-produced scarcity, which is what I'm going to teach in this particular video. So let's look at Beanie Babies. Beanie Babies came out in 1994. The craze lasted close to six long years. This is why, right around 1996, if you were criticizing the Beanie Baby craze, you were seen as crazy. I was one of those individuals back then that made a lot of money in Beanie Babies and was telling other people, hey, this market's a bubble. People called me crazy. Well, literally, by the time 1999 came along, they would figure out that I was right, that my mentors who taught me this was a craze were 100% correct. So this is what happened. In 1994... Beanie Babies came out of the gate. Now, Ty Warner was an eccentric dude. He was a marketing genius. He pretty much marketed his Beanie Babies in small specialty shops, gift shops, and boutiques. He didn't allow his Beanie Babies to be sold in big box retail stores. Now, that was really due to the fact that Ty, at the time, was a very small company, and he got worried that he wouldn't be able to fill orders if there was a significant demand for his products. The other reason he went through small shops was because he could control the market better. So in 1994, the first 37 coveted Beanie Babies premiered. And the first nine were Legs the Frog, Squealer the Pig, Brownie the Bear, Flash the Dolphin, Splash the Whale, Patty the Platypus, Chocolate the Moose, Spot the Dog, and Pinchers the Lobster. Now, I know that you didn't need to know that, but I know you wanted to know that. Now, in 1995, Ty, being as intelligent as he was, he looked at the market and he said, you know what? We're only going to release another nine Beanie Babies into the market. It's still not where we want it. So in 1995, 46 total Beanie Babies were released into the market. This includes the original 37 that were already released in 1994. Now, this is where things got interesting because this is something that nobody expected. In September of 1995, there was a company that premiered that was called Auction Web. Auction Web later became eBay in 1996. This was the world's first glimpse at the power of e commerce. And eBay, by 1996, was already running commercials on TV, radio ads, print ads to get the word out that buyers and sellers can come together on this online platform and pretty much sell and buy to the entire world. It was a new thing. People were hooked. People caught the collecting bug. People caught the reselling bug at this particular point in history. A lot of people, including myself, 
made a ton of money at this particular time. It wasn't just Beanie Babies that were going hot, that were going crazy. It was Pez dispensers. It was modern era Star Wars figures. Those of you that remember the orange back, the green back, Power of the Force 2, Kenner, Hasbro, Star Wars figures. Those of you that remember pre-Nintendo video games and systems, Atari, Coleco, and television, all that stuff was soaring in value at this time due to the advent of eBay. Now, this is where things got interesting because by 1996, Ty Warner was starting to really realize the fruits of his labor. He was looking at the market and he was going, hey, last year, we released a total of 46 Beanie Babies on the market. We got retailers selling out. We got people reaching out to me wanting to order more. And I told them, I'm going to start retiring some of these older Beanie Babies. Where If they want to buy them, they're only going to be available for a limited amount of time. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because Ty Warner then said, you know what also I want to do? I want to start releasing more and more new product into the market and consistently retiring it. So in 1996, they doubled the output of the year before. Remember, in 1995, they only released 46 Beanie Babies into the market. 1996, they doubled it to 92 total Beanie Babies. Now, Ty Warner, after he did this, he took a wait-and-see attitude, and he says, let's just see what the market does. Well, thanks to the rise of eBay, thanks to e-commerce, thanks to everybody, including the mainstream media, talking about the popularity and investment potential of Beanie Babies, Beanie Babies blew up beyond belief. To the point where in 1997, Ty Warner went and looked at the market, and he said, you know what? Last year, we released a total of 92 Beanie Babies into the market. This year, we're going to release 29 more. We're going to release 121 Beanie Babies into the market in the year 1997, while demand is trending upwards. Now, at this particular point in time, the Beanie Baby market still did not hit its peak. This is what a lot of people get wrong. People tell me all the time, oh, Sean, the Beanie Baby bubble only lasted two or three years. That is completely incorrect. I'm showing you how it played out just by utilizing actual production numbers here. So Ty Warner, again, being a very meticulous patient perfectionist, took a step back, looked at the market, and said, you know what? I still think we could do more with this. The next year, 1998, this is when the Beanie Baby market hit its peak. Ty Warner released a total of 176 beanies into the marketplace, which means he increased production by 55 Beanie Babies from the previous year. Now, if you look, a total increase in 55 Beanie Babies is actually more than the amount of Beanie Babies they produced in 1995, the second year of their release. This is the playbook that all manufacturers use, whether it's Funko Pop, whether it's Lego, whether it's Limited Run Games, whether it's Pokemon, whether it's Magic the Gathering, whatever company we're talking about here, they all understand the dynamics of creating a collectible craze and then pumping out more and more products, hoping that the speculators, the Timmies, the Kimmies, and the Poindexters keep buying up all of these different products over and over again, hoarding these items so the manufacturer makes more and more money. Now, this is where it gets interesting. A couple of key points here, guys. Back in the 1990s, the average Beanie Baby cost $5. In the year 1998, instead of going to the market and buying all 176 of these Beanie Babies at a cost of $5 a piece, you would have been better off taking that money and investing it in an S&P 500 index fund. Let me show you why. If you would have spent $5 on each one of these Beanie Babies, and you would have bought all 176 of them, you would have spent a total of $880. If you would have parked that money in an S&P 500 index fund back in 1998 and held it to today, 2023, you would have a grand total of $10,661.55, which includes the reinvestment of dividends that that fund would pay. 
The people that ended up spending all that money on those Beanie Babies at the peak, guess what happened the next year? The next year is when the bottom officially fell out of the Beanie Baby market. As a matter of fact, Ty was smart. Ty actually saw it coming and he pulled back production. In the year 1999, Ty Corporation only released 65 Beanie Babies into the market. This is a pullback of 111 Beanie Babies from the year before. The manufacturers know how to monitor the secondary markets and the primary markets for their products better than the average speculator, better than the average Timmy Kimmy and Poindexter who are calling these items investments, buying them up and putting them away, thinking they're gonna be worth money in the future. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, let's look at Funko Pops. Funko Pops premiered in 2010. As of 2023, as of the filming of this video, there are over 13,741 unique Funko Pops in total. Now, this is up from 8,366 in the year 2019. And it also indicates that revenues have dropped 17% in 2023 when compared to year-to-date revenues in 2022. What this means is Funko Pop is releasing more and more product into the market. Their revenues are suffering because the Timmy's, Kimmy's, and Poindexter's overall had slowed down buying Funko Pops. This is a massive speculative bubble. Funko Pops are no different than Beanie Babies. These particular items both lack organic collectability. Now, I know what you're going to say. Well, Sean, that's great. I don't collect Funko Pops. I never collected Beanie Babies. I collect Lego. I collect Magic the Gathering. I collect limited run games. I collect all these items with organic collectability. Well, let me give you some statistics that should give you pause. Let's talk about Lego first. Between 2002 and 2015, the Lego company only produced roughly 50 sets per year with a piece count over 500 pieces or more. From the year 2016 to 2022, the Lego company produced 114 sets on average that had a piece count over 500 pieces or more. Do you see how this company has increased production to take advantage of the Timmy's, Kimmy's, Poindexter's, wannabe investors, wannabe speculators, wannabe resellers coming into this market. If you walk into a Lego store, it is insane with the plethora of product they have readily available for you to buy and attempt to quote unquote invest in. In 2022, 10 sets were released with more than 3,000 pieces. This is double for how many sets were produced with more than 3,000 pieces from 2016. The manufacturers are taking advantage of you. Let's talk about Limited Run Games. Limited Run Games was founded in 2015. Great concept, brilliant concept. Nothing against Limited Run Games. The first releases were Breach and Clear for the PlayStation Vita and Saturday Morning RPG for the PlayStation 4. Now, what's interesting is, if you go and look up the value of those two games, first, obviously, Breach and Clear for the PlayStation Vita is the more rare or uncommon game in this particular scenario. Meaning, if you look it up on eBay, you're going to see that the average going rate for a factory-sealed copy of Breach and Clear for the PlayStation Vita, the first release from Limited Run Games in 2015, is roughly selling for around $300. Now, Saturday Morning RPG can be had for under $75, factory sealed to this very day. And this was back when Limited Run Games started releasing only a handful of titles every month. So the Timmy's, Kimmy's, and Poindexter's out there that tell me their Limited Run Games are going to be valuable in the future simply because the company only released two to 3,000 copies of each of those early releases. I'm sorry, it's not panning out. Today... The company has produced well over a thousand different releases across the Nintendo Switch platform, the PlayStation Vita, the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, 
even the Xbox One console is not immune. And this doesn't even include the plethora of collector's editions, deluxe editions, classic editions, the multiple different versions of these items and products that they produce on a regular basis. Do you guys understand what's happening here? All of these manufacturers, all they're doing is once they get you hooked on the item they're creating, they massively up the amount of different products they have available at retail. You guys want to believe so much that these items are worth investing in that you continue to buy more and more of these products, put them away, and just hope that they go up in value. We've already seen this happen with Nintendo Amiibos. How many different Nintendo Amiibos are being released in the market in any given month, any given year? Do you remember when it was only supposed to be the original Super Smash Brothers line. Well, today we have the Animal Crossing line, the Legend of Zelda line, the Metroid line, who knows what else. It is insane. This is why all of these modern era collectible manufacturers will beat you at your own game. And anybody who is watching this video who has any ounce of common sense and investment intelligence will say, you know what? Rather than trying to bet against all of this, I would just rather go and invest in a simple S&P 500 index fund. That is the lesson for today. Collectible manufacturers know how to prime the pump for their products. They know how to analyze these markets and they know how to take advantage of the Timmy's, Kimmy's, and Poindexter's at their own game. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you got anything out of this. Let me know your feedback in the comment section below.